from the from the tiniest tiny bacteria and phytoplankton to the largest of the blue whales. So biodiversity is all of the living things on earth. And within biodiversity, we also have a lot of different whales and dolphins. So there's 25 different species of whales and dolphins in Ireland. And this is amazing. So Ireland is actually one of the best places in the world to see whales and dolphins, which is pretty, pretty cool. So first of all, what is a whale and what is a dolphin? Now they live in the sea. So a lot of people might think that they're fish because you know fish live in the sea too, but they're actually not. Whales and dolphins are marine mammals. So they're mammals just like you and me. So they have to breathe air through a blowhole, which is basically their nose. But a whale's nose isn't at the front of its head like ours are, it's actually at the very top. And that's because it makes it easier to breathe then when they're surfacing. So whales and dolphins have to breathe air through their blowhole, while fish can breathe underwater through gills at the side of their body. Whales and dolphins also give birth to live calves where their fish will lay eggs. And also fish have scales and fish are kind of slimy as well. Whether whales and dolphins actually have skin almost like rubber. And they also have tiny little hairs when they're born. So all mammals have hair, they breathe air, and they also give birth to live young that suckle on milk. So that's a little bit about why whales and dolphins are not fish, they're mammals just like you and me. And we were talking about biodiversity there. So as we said, there's 25 different species of whales and dolphins. And within this, there's two types. So it's really biodiverse. There's odontocetes. And I know I can't see you all sitting in the classrooms, but if you can repeat that word. So we're gonna break it down now and maybe the teacher can say it with you. So it's O, Don, to seat. So it's like you're sitting down. And that basically means that they have true teeth. So teeth like we do. But a dolphin's tooth can look like this. And you can see there, guys, that this tooth is actually the size of my head, which is pretty cool that a dolphin tooth can be the size of my head. So if everyone can say that again, dolphins are called O Don to seats. And then whales are called Mr. Seats. So we can repeat that now again. So Miss T seats. And can anybody guess what their teeth looks like? Well, I'll show you. They look like this. This is baleen. And it's actually made out of hair. Whoop. Can you see it? There we go. So baleen plates are made out of keratin, which is the same material as our hair and fingernails. So whale teeth or the mysticetes, baleen whales, have hairy teeth, which is pretty cool. So that's just a little bit about the differences there, guys. But now, I'm sure you're all thinking, you have to go somewhere tropical to see whales and dolphins but like we said Irish waters is actually one of the best places in the world to see whales and dolphins. We have 25 different species of them and Ireland was actually one of the first countries to declare our waters a whale and dolphin sanctuary in Europe. So we declared our waters a sanctuary in 1991 and this basically means that we're going to protect them and we're going to protect all the variety of habitats and their productive root, uh, food sources that the whales are found in. So that's pretty cool too. Now, I know that you're all sitting in your classrooms at the moment, but I want to just tell you a little bit about where you can see these whales and dolphins and how maybe you all can get involved with your school or even at home with your parents. 
So whales and dolphins can be seen from headlands all over Ireland. And we've got a map there um, with some of the key locations. And you might even recognize some of these locations that are close to you. So you don't need a fancy boat or to be a fancy scientist to go out and see whales. You can all become citizen scientists, okay? And citizen science is really, really important because basically it's just regular people like you going out, maybe taking a walk on the beach um, and seeing a whaler and a dolphin and reporting it to us. And then we will record this in our sighting scheme which helps us conserve them as well. So if everyone, if anybody is near the coast and sees something unusual or weird, um, send a picture of it into the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group and we will validate it. So we'll tell you what you're seeing, what species. And then we will add that record into our database with um, your name as well. Um, and then it'll go towards conserving these animals. So you can all be ocean heroes and citizen science uh, scientists and get involved, which is also really cool. But we move along now, guys. So again, I know this is a webinar and I can't see, but hopefully you're all still there with us. And I want you now to just close your eyes for a second, if you can, and imagine that you're a whale swimming around in Irish waters. And I'm going to play you a whale sound now. So get ready for this. So your eyes are closed. You're imagining that you're a whale and you're making this noise. Okay, so I'm gonna play this for you now, if I can. Whoa. There we go, sorry now, it won't work. Okay, so are you ready? So your eyes are closed. You're imagining you're a whale swimming around. And you're going to make this noise, if I can get it to work. Yeah, there we go. Can you hear that? The eyes are closed. Okay, so that is a sperm whale making a noise. And I'm going to play it again because I want you to imagine what you would be doing to make this noise, okay? And I'm gonna play it again because it's really, really weird. It nearly sounds like a lawnmower or something, but it is actually a whale. So I'm gonna play it. Okay, so you're a whale, you're swimming around in the Atlantic Ocean and you're making this noise, what do you think you're doing? Why would whales want to be in Irish waters? Well, I'll tell you now, up on the screen, these little fish popped up and these little weird, small plankton looking things popped up and that is whale food. So Irish waters are really, really productive. We have a lot of yummy food that the whales and dolphins like to eat. So that's why they're here. That's why they come to Irish waters. They come here to feed on our productivity. And they make noises like we just heard that big wah noise when they're hunting. Because whales and dolphins, particularly the dolphins with the teeth, the odontocetes with teeth like this, echolocate to find their food. So kind of like bats, they use these really weird clicks to hunt their food and find the fish. So that's why they're in Irish waters. And you can all open your eyes now again. So you're, you're back in your classrooms, even though I know we'd, we'd like to be women around the place. So guys, we said that whales and dolphins come to Ireland to eat. So they come here to eat all the lots of yummy food and they use echolocation to find this food. That's an adaptation to living in the sea. But where do whales and dolphins fit into the food chain? So the food chain is where each living thing gets its food and its energy. And the food chain describes how energy is passed from one living thing to another. So the food chain begins with the producers, which is the tiny little plankton and krill. 
who make their own food, kind of like the garden plants, the grass, they make their own food through photosynthesis. And the next level are consumers. And these could be little forage fish. These are predators that eat the first level, okay? And at the very, very top of the food chain is going to be an apex predator who feed on all of the organisms below it. And whales and dolphins are apex predators. So they're the, they're the top guys in the ocean. Nobody really messes with them. And this is what a food chain should look like. Okay, so you've got your happy sun up the top. You've got your primary producers, then the plankton, which is the green little floaty guys here. Then you've got zooplankton, which are the little krill shrimp looking guys with the mustaches. Then you've got barge fish. And then at the very um, bottom, you've got the killer whale, the dolphin and the baleen whales here that are going to eat all of those yummy things under them. Okay, so that's cool but out of sight, out of mind. So again now, guys, I want you to think of three ways that people might negatively impact the environment and the food chain. And maybe you can shout your answers out to the teacher and they can put them into our Q&A button or into the chat button, what you guys think, um, how humans might negatively impact them. So I'll just give you a minute there to have a think about three ways humans might impact the marine environment. Tell teacher, and then if teacher can put them in to the chat button, that would be great. So I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. And we see lots of things coming in here. God, you're mighty. Fair play. Microplastics, hunting, yeah, lots of rubbish coming in here, overfishing. Yeah, pollution, oil spills, brilliant guys, well done. Nets, yeah, so we'd have some bycatch is what we call that. Climate change, very good. Yeah, lots of answers coming in there. God, you're mighty. Destroying their habitats, yeah, very, very good. Hunting whales, melting ice caps, very good. God, yeah, you got them all there. So you're dead right, guys. We're, humans can impact the environment through pollution. Um, through So we see here, this is how we're impacting the environment. So someone said nets. You can see that there's a dolphin caught in the net here. That's what we refer to as entanglement. So it's the accidental uh, when a, a dolphin or a whale gets wrapped up in a net. So you're absolutely right there. A lot of people said rubbish and marine litter and plastics. So yeah, it's really important when you're in school, when you're at home to recycle correctly and make sure you put your rubbish in the right bins. Because if you don't, it will end up in the ocean and then maybe a fish or a whale and a dolphin can eat that plastic or get stuck in it as well. Then we also have a boat up here up the top and you can see there's little noise coming out of it. So noise pollution is actually another way that humans can impact the environment. Because as we said, when you were pretending to be a whale and a dolphin, you closed your eyes and you were listening to the noise hunting for the fish. They use echolocation to do that. But if there's lots of noise from boats and from construction by humans, that's going to make a really noisy sea. And they're not going to be able to listen to one another or hunt their food using echolocation that well. So noise pollution is another way that we really impact them there. Somebody else said climate change. And that's actually a really, really good answer. So fair play to you for, for coming up with that. Because we are contributing to climate change. But... Whales and dolphins are ocean heroes, okay? So they are actually going to help us fight climate change. And they do this through carbon sequestration. And that's a really big word. So again, if everyone say it after me, carbon sequestration. It's a really tough one. 
And it basically means that whales and dolphins help us take out nasty uh, greenhouse gases out of the environment like carbon. So they do this basically by storing it in their blubber. So whales, especially the big whales, the great whales with the funny hairy teeth, they can capture a lot of carbon in their blubber and they store it over their lifespan like a giant swimming tree, which is pretty cool. So even though climate change is an issue at the moment, and you know, unfortunately humans are contributing to it with burning a lot of fossil fuels and everything, whales and dolphins are helping us fight that by capturing this carbon and they store it in their blubber throughout their lifespan. And then eventually when they die of old age, they sink to the bottom so you can see that in this picture here, the whale isn't looking too well. He's a bit sick and he's sinking to the bottom. And then all the nice little crabs that live at the bottom of the sea and the other little fish are going to eat him because that's how the ecosystem works. Everything is recycled in the food chain. So just as we need to recycle at home, the, the marine environment also recycles all of its nutrients. So when the whale eventually dies, maybe it's old and it's sick, all the little crabs are going to eat them. And then that's also going to take out the carbon from the atmosphere as well. And we call that in the science word, a carbon sink. So that's a really cool word. So carbon sequestration is how it takes it out of the environment. And then a carbon sink is when it's gone. So that's a cool one. They are also helping fight climate change by sequestering carbon and helping the food chain. Remember at the beginning there, we said that the food chain has lots of little links and everything is connected in and the whales are apex predators. They're at the top of the food chain, but they also help kickstart this food chain. And I wonder, can anybody think how they do that? And the pictures give you a bit of a clue. So they do that by eating all the nice food that's in the lower levels of the food chain. And whales are so big, they're the largest living animals in the world that they have to eat lots and lots of food. But then it has to go somewhere, right? So the whales do need to poop. And when they poop, their poos are so big that scientists, scientists actually call them poo nannies, which is kind of funny. Now everyone can say there's a poo nanny coming. And when the whales do that, they're releasing lots of lovely nutrients back into the environment, like not nitrogen and phosphorus and iron. And all of these nutrients are needed by the phytoplankton, phytoplankton, sorry, that are at the base of the food chain. So those are our primary producers. They need these nutrients as well as sunlight to grow. So by the whales eating the little planktons and the fish, and pooing, the big poo nannies, they're actually helping control the food chain and start it again, which also helps take out carbon from the environment and helps us fight climate change. So they're really, really important. And basically, the more whales, therefore, that we can have in our waters, the more we are able to kickstart the food chain and take carbon and other nasty things out of the environment, which is going to be really, really important if we're to fight the climate crisis here. So if you think back now to how whales are fighting climate change and what you can do to help. So I want you all at home and in the classroom to be ocean heroes as well. We want you to get active and involved in local conservation projects, which you can do because you can all be citizen scientists and share your experiences on the beach or going out for a walk um, with groups like the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group or like Birdwatch Ireland. And then we can learn more about the environment and help conserve it. So you can be a part of that. And you can also be an ocean hero by reducing your waste, refusing certain products, so, you know, unnecessary plastic and recycling as well. 
So just like the whales are ocean heroes, you can also be ocean heroes and we can fight climate change. So I hope that that all made sense to everyone and fair play for, for giving me such good answers um, there with the threats, you were brilliant. And um, so I hope if you have any questions now or anything, I can maybe stop sharing that screen there. Thanks so much, Shabail. That was really interesting. And there was a nice bit of interaction there as well. Yeah, some great answers to your question. Yeah, you were absolutely fantastic. Yeah, climate change, yeah, loads of great answers. Um, yeah. so we have loads of questions. We have 55 right. in the Q&A box already. So oh, we're wow. going to, yeah, we'll kickstart the Q&A session. Um, let's see, where will we start with? I saw this question a few minutes ago. And I thought it was a great one from Mrs. Golding. Where does a whale sleep? Where does a whale sleep? This is a fantastic, fantastic question. Fair play. So whales and dolphins are actually super cool when they sleep. So dolphins um, only sleep with half of their brain at a time. So they actually have to sleep. And this is so they can keep an eye out. They still need to breathe air, remember. So they need to come to the surface of the water to breathe air. So when a dolphin is asleep, they turn off half of their brain and the half of their brain, basically the opposite eye will be open. So if I was sleeping with my right side of my brain off, my left eye is going to be open. And if I was then resting the left side of my brain, the right eye is going to be open. And they do this so they can still be a little bit alert if there was any anything coming, their predator, maybe a shark, um, or also they can still come to the surface to breathe. So that's how dolphins sleep except for the sperm whale, the guys that we listened to earlier with the big wah noise, they are the best nappers in the world. So these guys sleep with all of their brain turned off and they will only sleep for a very short amount of time. They'll only sleep for about 10 to 15 min minutes at a time and making them the, the least sleep dependent animal in the world so they really they only sleep for about seven percent of their lives i think wow that's so interesting i never would have known the answer to that question thank you there we go now that was a brilliant question thank that's you very good okay so we'll go to the next one um it's actually the same teacher and um, mrs golding asks how many babies can they have at once so i guess whales and dolphins do they have one baby at a time or do they have multiple yeah brilliant question as well so uh, whales and dolphins tend to only have one baby at a time and depending on the species they might only have one baby every kind of three to four years and this again is comes down to their biology so whales and dolphins are mammals like we are and so their babies need to be taught a lot of things so the the baby will actually stay with mom and stay with the family for a long time after it's born, learning how to eat and where to go and what to do, just like we do. Okay, very good. Um, Grania Campbell wants to know, can the blowhole of a whale or dolphin get blocked by plastic or pollution? It can, um, especially the smaller ones. Unfortunately, especially small dolphins, if there was like a plastic bag maybe, and if it was able to go over the head, um, it could block their, their blowhole, but that's very, very rare and seldom happens. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. The main problem with plastic and other marine debris is that they might eat them accidentally yeah. and blocks up their tummies. Um, and that's it. With motivation to use reusable bottles. and Yeah, exactly. If, if people can reuse reusable water bottles or you know, reusable lunch boxes, all of that kind of stuff would be really helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, Miss Gamble asks, how can you tell a dolphin's age? That's a really good question. And I'll bring you back to the teeth. So just like when they're swimming around um, being sequestering carbon, like giant swimming trees, their teeth are also kind of like trees. So you know the way if a tree was cut down, you'll see lots of different rings on it and there'll be a dark band and there'll be a light band mm -hmm. when i was to cut this tooth open in half there would also be dark and light bands so the whales and dolphins put down rings in their teeth 
And after they die, we're able to cut them open and put a special stain on them. And then we can count these rings just like you do with a tree. And that's how we find out their age. That's really interesting. And what about if the dolphin was still alive? Would you just use the length as a guide uh, as to how? Yeah. So if, if they were still alive, we can't really get an exact age. Um, but we break them up then into calves, uh, juveniles, subadults, and adults. And we do this by their length. Okay. Very good. Um, and that same teacher asked, and it's kind of related, how old can a dolphin live for? So we'll go with the bottlenose dolphins because that's the guy that, oh, is it this way? No, that way. The guy that's in the corner uh, is a bottlenose dolphin beside me. And bottlenose dolphins so can live to be about 60 or 50 years old. And I see there's a question there about fungi as well. Fungi was a bottlenose dolphin and he was quite old. And I actually did see him as well. So Literally, yeah. And lots of questions about fungi the last few days. Um, yeah. Another interesting question from Michelle. From what distance can the noise of a sperm whale be heard? Wow, that's a really good question. So sperm whales are the loudest odontocetes, so the guys of the true teeth in the world. And sound actually travels a lot faster and further underwater than it does through air. So we don't know exactly how far they can travel, but the likes of the sperm whales and also the baleen whales, the guys with the, the furry teeth, their um, vocalizations or their noises have been heard for hundreds of kilometers away. And that's how we think that the whales often are seen maybe by themselves or maybe just with one other whale and it can be quite lonely but um, when they're talking to each other they could be talking to a whale let's say if a, if a humpback whale was in Ireland it could be chatting to another whale in Scotland because their noise travels that far. That's amazing yeah. they're very loud. <laughs> yeah it's because it's a low a low frequency so low frequencies are going to travel a lot further as well just so different to us isn't it like you wouldn't even imagine that they could talk so far away from each other it's just... yeah it's cool yeah uh we have a question from or more which i think is rory Moore. what's the difference between a whale and a porpoise that's a really good question so a porpoise is very small so in ireland we only have one species of porpoise and that's the harbour porpoise and they are quite small they do have true teeth um, so they'd be kind of closely, more closely related to the dolphins than whales. Um, but they're a lot smaller and their teeth aren't pointy like this. They have kind of spatulate teeth, which is kind of cool. And in the Latin name as well, so the harbour porpoise in Latin is called Fokina Fokina. Whether a dolphin like um, the common dolphin, let's say, is Delphinus Delphinus. And so when we look at taxonomy, in the Latin names, they're also in different families. So the harbour porpoise is in the Fokina family and the common dolphin would be in the Delphinus family or the dolphin family. So closely related, but not the same. Yeah. What we're saying, yeah. Okay, great. Um, Ransborough National School would like to know, how long can a whale stay underwater for? Really good answer or a really good question. So it depends on the species. So if we were to look at really deep diving whales, like the beaked whales or the sperm whales that we listened to earlier, they can dive really, really deep. So a cougar's beaked whale is another species that's in Irish waters. And they have been recorded to hold their breaths and dive to about 1500 meters and they can hold their breath for about an hour and a half. But then other whales, like the sperm whales, would only hold their breath for maybe 50 minutes to an hour. And then the humpback whales or the baleen whales, or this baleen is actually from a minky whale, which is Ireland's smallest baleen whale, they would only hold their breath for about 15 minutes. And then if you were to look at the dolphins, they can hold their breath only for about five minutes, maybe seven minutes max. So it depends on the species. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, and you just mentioned Ireland's smallest whale there, the minky whale. And I, yeah. there was a question earlier that actually asked, what is the smallest whale? Is that the small, is the minky the smallest yeah. whale in the whole world? 
No, so a minke whale is the smallest baleen whale in Ireland. Um, but there are there are other uh, whales when you're looking at a global scale. Okay, very good. And another question about the whales in Ireland, are there blue whales in Ireland? There are blue whales in Ireland and one was actually seen offshore last year uh, out past the Aran Islands in Galway. And so the blue whale is the largest whale in the world. It's also the largest animal in the world. And we do have them in Irish waters, but they're a little bit further out to sea. And um, so it can be hard to see them from land. Okay. And when you're in Ireland and you're looking for whales, what would be the most common type that you would come across? The most frequently seen from a headland, let's say. So if you don't want to go out in a fancy boat, let's say if, if you're in Dublin, I see some Dublin schools there. Hoth Head is a really good place um, to go in Dublin. And you're very likely to see the harbour porpoise, which is the smallest guy. Also the minke whales, very frequently seen which is the smallest baleen whale. And then things like bottlenose dolphins, which fungi would have been one. If you're in Cork anywhere at the moment or Kerry, there is humpback whales and fin whales near you at the moment. So, yeah. So it kind of depends where you are and the time of the year. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, Miss O'Mahony asks, how do the whales eat if they have hair as their teeth? It's a really good question. So I'll show you. So the baleen, okay, hangs from their upper jaw. Whoa, there we go. Whoa, there we go. And basically it hangs in a plate, like a big curtain in their upper jaw. The whale is going to take a big gulp of water in and using its tongue, it's going to push the water out in between little plates in between the baleen. You can kind of see those little slats in between them there. So with their tongue, they push the water out. Then all of the tiny little fish and krill get stuck in the hair and they lick the inside of their mouths with their tongue. And that's how they eat. Okay, so they must have a really big tongue then, do they? They have a massive tongue, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, a question from Ronya Campbell. What age do baby whales leave their mothers? Oh, that's really good. Um, so again, it kind of depends on the species. We were talking about biodiversity there and how there's lots of different things. So if we focus on a bottlenose dolphin, um, they will um, start to wean off their mums after about a year and a half, maybe two years, but sometimes even up to three years. And even after that, so when they're not suckling on milk anymore, they'll still hang around mum for a lot of years after that. Okay, lots to learn, yeah. Um, Stephen in third class in Skullvara Horsewood wants to know what is the most, what is the rarest species of dolphin? Ooh. In Ireland or in the world? I'm not sure. He didn't say, so we'll say. So in Ireland, a very rare species to see is the beaked whales, the guys that stay down, in, they hunt in really deep water and can hold their breaths for a really long time. So kind of like the Cougar's beaked whale, it'd be very rare to see those. And that's just because it can be really hard to spot them because uh, they hold their breaths for so long. But if you're talking kind of globally, the Fiquita, if I can pronounce that right, the Fiquita dolphin uh, or porpoise in, uh, in around Mexico, the Gulf of, of Mexico there, um, they are the rarest dolphin in the world. And that's because they're actually nearly extinct. So they're very threatened. Okay, that's good to know, thank you. Um, next question, what happens uh, when a whale or dolphin loses a tooth? And that comes in from Thomas in Boris in Ossery. Very good. So they actually aren't like sharks. So sharks have lots of rows of teeth. Um, and if they lose them, they can replace them again. Whales and dolphins aren't like that. So they're more like humans, actually, um, especially the odontocetes, the guys with the real true teeth. They get baby teeth just like we do. And then when they're a little bit older, they get their adult teeth. And if they lose an adult tooth, just like us, they can't replace it. So they're going to have a missing tooth then. And in some species like killer whales or orcas, actually getting tooth infections 
is really common there. And um, they can actually die because they get a really bad tooth abscess because they can't replace them. And of course, they can't go to the dentist like we can. Oh, yeah. A sore tooth can be very sore, yeah, or an abscess. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> here's an interesting question. Mrs. Gannon, sorry, Mr. Gannon's class want to know, is whale puke, meaning vomit, is whale vomit valuable? We aren't sure if it is used for perfume or not. Ah, you're talking about ambergris there. And yes, it is very valuable and it's very, very hard and rare. Uh, it's hard to find and it's, it's very rare, but it is used in certain um, perfumes, in very high end expensive perfumes in particular. Uh, so yeah, it's called ambergris and uh, it is essentially whale puke. Yeah. yeah that's amazing. Did I, is it very smelly? Did I hear that as well? Or? It is and it's quite waxy actually. It feels quite waxy. And you can sometimes find it in, in little balls on the beach. Um, and it is kind of smelly, but it's very valuable. Okay, <laughs> we'll have to keep an eye out for that in our beach cleans. I know, yeah. Um, Lisa wants to know, what does a whale drink? Does a whale have to drink anything? Ah, so whales and dolphins actually don't drink um, water. They get their water, their liquids through the food that they eat. So when they eat fish, they get their hydration then through that. Okay, good to know. Um, someone else asks, or uh, let's see, Lisa asks, how can they jump out of the water? And um, there might be a typo on that. So it might be how high can they jump out of the water? Or maybe you can just tell us why did they jump out of the water as well? Yeah, it's actually a really good question. And it's a behavior known as breaching. So when we're looking, when we're surveying out on a boat and we see that behavior, we call it breaching. And we're actually not too sure why they do it. Some people think that it, it's, you know, juveniles, so kind of teenage dolphins playing. Some people think that it might be a communication method, because when we look at minke whales in particular, they tend to jump out of the water when it's really rough weather for some reason. Um, so, yeah, we're not too sure, but they they do jump quite high out of the water. Sometimes um, bottlenose dolphins can jump a couple of meters out of the water, maybe two or three meters. So, oh, yeah. It'd be a great thing to see if you're right on a boat or if you're on the head. Yeah. Off, it be? yeah, it's pretty cool. And you can see it from land as well when they jump out. And basking sharks also jump out of the water sometimes, which is cool. Wow, that would be a sight. Yeah. Um, Danielle Williamson wants to know, how do you tell the difference between male and female whales and dolphins? And that comes in from Rathkenny Junior Room. So how can you tell the difference between male and females? Very good question. Again, it does depend on the species, but if we look at our killer whale or our orca, again, they have something called sexual dimorphism, which is a very, very fancy word for saying that the males and the females look a bit different. So male orcas are much bigger. They're a lot larger than females. They can reach about nine meters in length and their dorsal fin so the fin at the back of their the back of their backs can be very, very tall. It can be about two meters in length. Whether the female orcas will only grow to be about seven meters long and their dorsal fins are going to be a lot shorter and more curved as well. So they visually look a bit different. OK, very good. And um, I think we'll take our last question now because I'm, I. I think we've gone through so many questions and you've been great at answering them. Thank you. So the last Ooh. one is a nice one, Chevelle. It's what is your favorite whale and why? Oh, that's a that's actually really hard. I think that's the hardest question ever. <laughs> um, my favorite whale is probably kind of changes with the weather. I love bottlenose dolphins. The guys that, so fungi was a bottlenose dolphin. And I love looking at those because they're very, very interesting. And we can actually recognize individuals um, as well. They have their dorsal fin is kind of like a fingerprint. So I really like th that species because um, when you're looking at them for a really long time, you start to recognize individuals. But I also love humpback whales and the sperm whales as well that we listened to earlier because they're really cool and mad looking. But yeah. that's a really good question and it's kind of a hard one. 
<laughs> it is hard to pick and there's so many amazing ones and they're all amazing for their own individual reasons I guess exactly yeah exactly. brilliant okay well thank you everyone for your brilliant questions um a great fun reading them out and I found it so much today Shabelle thanks so much your talk was brilliant whales and dolphins are just fascinating creatures so I think everyone really enjoyed your talk today so thank you very much no worries thanks for having me and thanks everyone for such great engagement your questions were brilliant so great thanks okay so thanks, before Sarah. I go I just want to say that um we've had some great engagement on social media as well um, and we've actually given away some of our spot prizes already. So what we're asking schools to do is just take a picture of them taking part in the webinar today or maybe put up a picture of some of your draw along pictures or any activities that you're doing in your school relating to Marine Week. And you can tag us at Green Schools IRE or use the hashtag Marine Week 22. So yesterday we gave away trying to find the name of the school now here we are yesterday we gave away two book bundles one to Skull Ursula in Sligo and one to St Dominic's in Tala so we have a couple of more prizes left to give away so make sure and tag us in any of your photos or posts online and we'll be back again tomorrow with another live talk from our Marine Ambassador School Tala Sanctuous College in Galway and we're looking forward to hearing from them from them and hopefully we'll see you all back here at half eleven Enjoy the rest of your day. Hopefully you can take part in some of our activities online. Okay, thank you very much for coming. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye, everybody.